When Nintendo debuted this footage of the remake of the 93 classic A Link's Awakening earlier this year, something awoke in the dormant, frozen heart of this ageing millennial. Though much as I'm ready to buy into this glossy anime bobblehead Toy Story look, which is of course simply an evolution of the camera shots in the original game, there's something about the rough pixely simplicity of 93's Awakening that I will always love. Whilst Nintendo moved further from their 8 and 16-bit aesthetic origins to glossy 3D, increasing hordes of indie devs are returning to the nostalgic simplicity of pixel artwork. But why? Is it purely a nostalgic cash grab? Perhaps a cost-cutting technique? Or could it actually be an artistic choice that will continue to blossom in its own right? Because for the generation younger than me, who grew up on the likes of Super Mario Galaxy and Halo 3, pixel art is some dusty relic of an ancient past before they were born, like VHS tapes, blockbuster video, and dial-up internet. Yet pixel art prevails, so I'm going to check out why, I'm going to look at innovative uses of the form, and at what makes it so timeless. Let's begin by looking at Hyperlight Drifter. It has this unique, saturated, neon 80s pixel style, initially based on pairing back technical ambition to a level that a one-man band could realistically work on. Alex Preston had started out actually working on a style that was super illustrated and highly stylized, but ultimately he found that working in a lower resolution to be much more efficient. Hyperlight Drifter's main inspiration is clearly a link to the past on the SNES. In that game, Link's sprite is only 16 pixels wide and 24 across, which makes for a total of around 300 to 400 pixels. That's compared to ballpark 50 to 100,000 polygons on characters in current AAA titles. Wait for me, boy! All of the NPCs in A Link to the Past flick between only a handful of separate sprites. This requires so little total artwork that you can actually see the entirety of the game's character art on this screen right now. When Link swings his sword, the animation is made up of only six different sprite drawings, with one of those frames held to add impact to a strike, and the sprite artwork barely changes between them. This is truly a manageable workload for even one person. It's this ease of creation that allowed Lucas Pope to craft the BAFTA winning communism sim Papers Please, Eric Barone to single-handedly create the best Harvest Moon game, and Thomas Hatt to make the NES throwback Axiom Verge solo. Fellow pixel artist Jason Perry notes the potential shortcomings of HD. He points out that low resolution naturally hides a lot of errors. When you move to higher resolutions or have really complex animations, your shortcomings will be noticeable. If a character's joints aren't moving in precisely the right way and interacting with muscles just so, for example, the player's immersion will be instantly broken. Sorry, my face is tired from dealing with everything. Moving between just a handful of sprites makes this considerably less of an issue for developers. Perfect. But it's not just technical ease. Pixel art offers up advantages to gameplay and artistry too. A fixed camera angle means that players will always view a scene in precisely the way that developers intended. So this huge, throbbing heart in Hyperlight Drifter will always be central to the scene, and this amazing vista will always fill the frame. It's integral to the gameplay too. Much of Hyperlight Drifter is built around secrets barely visible to the player. This tiny square hints to the player that a hidden passageway is adjacent. And the tone of the game is very much one of player-led discovery, from the world to the gameplay mechanics. These small visual clues are something that the player begins to notice as they learn how the game world is constructed. But pixel art isn't always seen as the easy route. Last year's Dead Cells was actually created, modelled and animated in 3D, before being downscaled, effectively using a really complex version of the mosaic tile Photoshop filter that you probably used back in graphics class at school. So the game that runs in 3D renders on the screen as this. For these devs, pixel art was an aesthetic choice rather than a practical one giving a uniquely stylized look, uh, which brings to mind the Super Metroid and Castlevania games that it was initially based on, but with the fluidity of a contemporary game. So we've established why indie devs are drawn to pixel art, but what's perhaps most interesting about recent games of this style are how they use today's technology and processing power to go above and beyond what was possible in the 16-bit era, and how that suggests that pixel art might have a future beyond merely nostalgic retreading or pastiche. Celeste is playful in its visual styles. It's not restricted by its basic 240p boundaries. 
It has moments when its 1080p output resolution is used to warp the pixels. It has a 3D level select screen that contextualizes the game and Madeline's climb up the mountain. And the game's cutscenes use HD detailed illustrative artwork to give the characters themselves more of a sense of emotion and life during the cutscenes, complemented with typography that is kinetic and crisp, lending a kind of graphic novel feel. Just look at her. And the third dimension is often utilised by devs. Fez combines 2D gameplay with the twist of being housed in a 3D world that can be spun on its axis. And more recently, Mario Odyssey projects 2D pixel throwback levels onto 3D geometry. Invention is Myriad, and these levels integrate seamlessly to the game. But perhaps the most striking and visually inventive use of pixel art since its renaissance can be seen in Square's Octopath Traveler. Here, 2D pixel sprites and environments are used as textures and models in a 3D world. Square used the hardware and the tools at their disposal to full effect, so that snowflake particles fall from the sky, volumetric fog sifts through the foreground and background of the scenes, and the whole world has this amazing kind of depth to it, with a narrow depth of field giving this tilt-shift diorama. This is a photographic technique that makes landscapes appear to be tiny, like models. Beams of light pierce from above, and in battle, particle effects and glows add oomph to attacks. Combining these with detailed 3D effects, HD hand-drawn cell animation, and the pixel animation of the characters and enemies gives each battle a real sense of dynamism. Most of all, the lighting is used to full effect. Shadows fall off the 3D sprites as they traverse the world, and attacks in battle create these incredible beacons of contrast. The overall effect is something that looks totally unique, referencing the old whilst being completely fresh and new. In an interview with Eurogamer, Masashi Takahashi identified a key aspect of old games, that SNES games were so successful because we try to imagine what they couldn't express directly on screen. With Octopath, they aimed to make a game that brings us back to that time, when we needed to imagine situations, emotions, but with a new looking graphical aspect. And this, I think, gets to the heart of what makes these games so special and fantastic, and what will allow the pixel art style to continue to endure. When you think back to the Super Nintendo Legend of Zelda, you remember enormous landscapes, massive dungeons. It's easy to return to them and be surprised at their simplicity and their true scale. When you cast your mind back to the end of Pokemon Gold and its amazing final battle, your memory projects a huge amount of gravity and importance to the ellipsis of Trainer Red at the game's climax. For me, this was gaming. It's a deep part of my childhood, blowing on cartridges, slotting in memory cards and squinting at a tiny screen. That 250 pixel wide panel expanded to an entire world in my brain, to live in and explore. It is often said that modern gaming has reached such a fidelity that it's akin to the experience of watching a film. If this is the case, then games using pixel art are more akin to that of reading a novel. It demands creative input from the player's imagination. The gap between the pixels allows our mind the space to imagine worlds and create characters in our minds any bit as fleshed out and convincing as any of the biggest budget titles released today. The future of pixel art looks bright, because it can be twisted in so many ways and because it is a totally different way of experiencing and interpreting games. I look forward to seeing how the style will develop from here. If you've made it all the way through to here, thank you so much for watching. If you could drop me a like and maybe hit subscribe, I would hugely appreciate it. And let me know in the comments what your favourite example of recent pixel art might be.